Hello, welcome to Rappler Talk. I'm Marites Vitug, and joining us is Hans Vrins, based in Singapore. Hans is the managing partner and founder of Vrins and Partners, a leading government affairs and political risk analysis firm based in Singapore and focused on Southeast Asia. Vrins and Partners has offices in Singapore, Indonesia, Vietnam, Myanmar, Thailand, Malaysia, the Philippines, and Cambodia. And of course, I should mention this, Hans is a former journalist. So welcome to Rappler Talk, Hans. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to speak about the impact, the political impact of the pandemic in Southeast Asia, as you've been watching the region for at least three decades, right? And uh, I've, been, I've been attending some of your webinars and I've found them very informative. So maybe the first question is just to give a context. In Southeast Asia, which countries are standing out in terms of their response to the coronavirus? And, and what, what factors make them stand out? You mean in a positive and a negative way? <laughs> first, first the positive, then we go to the negative. So, so actually, uh, there's something that's even more important, and that there is a, is a real split between... Uh, maritime Southeast Asia and mainland Southeast Asia. Actually, mainland Southeast Asia seems to have largely escaped the pandemic. Vietnam, Thailand, Cambodia, and Myanmar. And it is not because Myanmar and Cambodia have the most excellent healthcare system in the world. So something else is, uh, is happening there. But I say so far, because it can still happen because there's a pandemic raging in neighboring uh, Bangladesh. Then there is maritime Southeast Asia. So I see uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, and the Philippines. And especially the Philippines and Indonesia have been hit the hardest in Southeast Asia. But compared to other countries in the world, I mean, uh, they have been economically hit hard, and of course, it's, it's very serious that people are dying. But if we look at the number of cases, as far as we know, it is still, uh, it, it, it is not as bad as it is in many countries. But this may also be caused by the fact that we simply don't know uh, how many people are really suffering. And there's real fear that there's a sharp increase in the number of cases in the Philippines and Indonesia that the increase is much higher than the official figures indicate. So you mean, Hans, there is a geographical factor at work here? As you said, Thailand, Cambodia, Myanmar, Vietnam are not as affected as mainland Southeast Asia. Yeah, so it's a bit of a mystery uh, why this is. I mean, there are clear reasons why Vietnam escaped. Uh, Vietnam took, by the way, and, and, and Thailand too, they, they, they took measures uh, they, they, they really locked down uh, right from the, the moment the virus uh, showed up. And by the way, Vietnam had learned a lot from the SARS uh, epidemic in 2003. So they immediately closed schools and they didn't wait, like the Philippines and Indonesia waited and procrastinated for a long time before the government took any real measures against it. Uh, and by the way, Singapore also waited for a long time. Singapore thought that, it was, uh, that the government was so brilliant that they could survive this without a lockdown. And they went a long way, but in the end, they unfortunately overlooked a major uh, epidemic that was raging among the, the mostly Bangladeshi foreign workers uh, uh, who live in separate compounds in, in Singapore. So you're saying that Singapore early on in the reports that we, we, we were getting was touted as a model uh, really? and then came the figures on the overseas workers, the migrant workers. So you mean uh, Singapore, how, do you, how would you rate them? It's a containment of the virus. You live there. <laughs> sure. I mean, I mean, Singapore, of course, is, uh, is, uh, is difficult to compare with, uh, with the Philippines uh, and Indonesia. I mean, it's just a small city-state. There's a very uh, uh, strong government institutions. So they, they thought they could do this, but in the end, they had to, uh, they had to uh, 
go to a lockdown and they have done that and now we are so they basically they have two parallel epidemics one among the foreign workers which is very serious at least in, in terms of numbers but actually actually if we look at the number of death among those people or the number of foreign workers who are in the, in intensive care it's very very small so there may be and the, and then the the numbers in the community is also very small yesterday i think it was two so that's very virtually negligible there may be something else and that is i'm not a doctor i'm just speculating here i was not the u.s president but it seems that that the virus is, has mutated and has perhaps less serious than it is in many other parts of the world where the death rate is much higher than in Southeast Asia. So in that sense, Southeast Asia so far seem to have escaped the worst in, 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 in medical sense. Of course, economically, it has been hit quite hard, especially the Philippines and Indonesia. What account for the status of Philippines and Indonesia? They're lagging behind in Southeast Asia. They have the most number of cases, uh, the most number of deaths also. Yeah. And these are yeah. both democracies. Yeah, but I, I don't think it has anything to do with democracies because, uh, because uh, Taiwan is also a democracy and South Korea too. And they've done really an excellent, uh, excellent job, perhaps the best in the world, especially Taiwan. Especially if you're considering how close it is to China. Uh, it has more to do with the strength of government institutions and the ability to act and act fast and act based on science, based on figures. If you don't know how serious the virus is, how many cases there are, it's very difficult for a government to make decisions. And Vietnam knew that it was very, they realized it was serious uh, and they have the ability to track and trace, they have the, they, they, they have, they have the figures at their, sorry, the figures at their fingertips, but they knew they had to act and they did so. But even there, uh, despite the fact that there's no longer social distancing, that everything seems to have gone back to normal in Vietnam just this week, there's a major spike in Da Nang and 80,000 domestic tourists from all over Vietnam have been sent back. So even in Vietnam, it's not over. Uh, and it's not over anywhere, but so far, we must give Vietnam credit. They've done a remarkable good job in, 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 in dealing with it, but they've set, a, they've set a very high standard because zero cases, that is not sustainable. And they, they basically had to shut the borders to, to continue that. And of course, shutting your borders for an also an economy, relatively open economy, where it's also to some extent dependent on tourism is not a long-term option. So it seems that Vietnam will do everything to keep its record of zero deaths. Uh, but, you said, done yeah, but you said it's not sustainable. And it's also difficult to copy Vietnam because they're a one-party state and really sure. their, their contact tracing was, was amazing. Three layers, right? Three tiers, which we can't do here in the Philippines. Yeah, because they, they were prepared, they acted very fast, and I think what we have seen, and we were also not surprised about that, unfortunately, in Indonesia and in the Philippines, both, I mean, of course, uh, very large archipelagos, difficult to govern, with weak governments at all layers, the national, national government, but also regional government. So the, their ability to implement and enforce policies is relatively weak. And, and we see the result of that. And by the way, they were also not really prepared. They didn't have the PPE, they didn't have the testing equipment. That took forever to get. And if you can't test, you don't know. And if you, can't know, if you don't know, you can't track and trace. There is no way you can flatten the curve. In Thailand, it's also remarkable that there, there have been no new cases in the last weeks. And this is run yeah. by a, a military government, but I am told that they listen to the experts. So what is the secret of Thailand? So, I mean, it's again, it's, 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 it's not about a military government. The Thailand, Thailand has been somewhat lucky, just like Myanmar. Yeah? But, but on top of that, uh, Thailand has a, has a really good healthcare system. 
and, uh, and they also acted fast. And, they, and, and again, the government acted, acted when the first signs became obvious of, uh, of the virus. They immediately uh, took measures instead of waiting till it's almost too late. It's very difficult to put the genie back into the bottle and, and, and better make sure it ne never leaves the bottle. Among the Southeast Asian countries, which is the most economically devastated by this pandemic? Oof, probably the Philippines and, uh, and Indonesia. I mean, Singapore took a big, big hit, uh, but Singapore is rich. She, Singapore has huge reserves and they could dig into those. The Philippines and Indonesia don't have the governments don't have those kind of reserves, so they are they are more badly hit, and 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 uh, and mainland Southeast Asia has largely really escaped, and uh, they I mean like Vietnam it's really back to normal, uh, back to normal without the tourists, uh, but even in uh, if you take a domestic flight in Vietnam, nobody's wearing masks, the middle seats are occupied, it is as nothing has ever happened. As you said, Philippines and Indonesia are among the most economically devastated. And in the Philippines, where uh, our economy has contracted, we're going through a recession. And our FD, the foreign direct investments are also declining. And uh, is this not just because of the pandemic, right? Why are, is the Philippines so unattractive to foreign investors? So, uh, especially for manufacturing, uh, okay, so uh, we be living in a fast changing world, a world that is uh, de-globalizing. And I mean, if you can't travel, it's also more difficult to invest and, and with shortened supply uh, lines. Actually, there should have been a major opportunity for, for the Philippines to attract uh, investment that is leaving China. Unfortunately, this goes back a long time, uh, the Philippines has never built up an industrial base. And as a result of that, you, people can't move there. Uh, so we you know many companies that have left uh, China, either because it's becoming too expensive or as a result of the Trump uh, trade war against uh, China, and they nearly all go to Vietnam or to Malaysia, depending on if they're looking for really low wages, it's more Vietnam. Uh, and if it's more sophisticated and more high end, they go to Malaysia. So unfortunately, the, Phil the, the, the Philippines doesn't really, they doesn't really show up in, the, in their consideration. Oh my, so we're missing, we missed this boat again. Yes, <laughs> I'm so. On the question of uh, the political impact of the pandemic. In Singapore, do you, would you say that, of course, the PAP still won, they have a dominant mm -hmm. seat in the parliament, but they lost less than a dozen seats, I think. So is this because of their handling of the pandemic? Is, are, or is there a growing opposition triggered also by the way that PAP handled the pandemic? I mean, it's, it's part of it. I mean, it, I mean, it's difficult to gain popularity if you're handling a pandemic. Uh, and they also made, uh, made mistakes like everybody else. But beside that, I mean, the era of, uh, of uh, former Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew is long over, long over. And I think uh, Singapore is becoming clearly a more mature democracy. And, as, and so people are no longer afraid to vote for the opposition. And by the way, the PAP still won. But uh, for the, uh, we have now real opposition, and for the first time, the, uh, we actually have a, have a designated leader of the opposition in parliament. It was a tricky situation because they held elections, you know, during the pandemic. In the Philippines, our presidential elections will take place in two years. Do you think uh, the, it will still be a factor the way the government handled the crisis? Will it still be a factor two years from now? So, so that depends. It really depends on, on uh, if, the, if the virus will still be among us. And it's, it's actually, that's the bad news. It is very likely it will still be there. Because even if there would be a vaccine uh, at the end of this year, 
before it will come to Southeast Asia and before you have the ability to vaccinate all people in the Philippines, especially, by the way, after the debacle of the previous government, which is its vaccination campaign against dengue, that will take a long time. I mean, this has hardly ever happened in the world. So we, we may be talking about four or five years. So we have to live, learn to live with the virus. And that means uh, do all the things we are doing, social distancing, masks, uh, track and trace, isolate, and occasional lockdowns. Uh, that stuff, but uh, that so that that could that possibly could take another two years. Oh no, that's a long time, Hans. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Uh, I mean, I mean, <laughs> that's how it looks like right now. But but it's difficult to predict how a virus will will uh, react in react in the future. But if we take the lessons from the nineteen eighteen flu uh, uh, pandemic. That lasted, and we had three waves, and that lasted for more than two years. So we should not assume uh, that it will be over in a few months, because it will still be among us. Talking about the vaccine, will the ASEAN be able to move uh, as a block and, you know, lobby for, you know, uh, negotiate already this early with different uh, companies? I mean, US, UK, China for access to the vaccine? So, I mean, it, uh, unfortunately not. I mean, it, 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 it would be a great idea for ASEAN to come together and do this as a block. Yeah? I mean, ASEAN uh, represents 600 million people. Uh, that's a significant uh, number. However, as we have seen during the pandemic, it is every government for themselves, and there's really no solidarity at all. Uh, so that's very difficult to see that, that, that ASEAN will do that. By the way, it is also not really set up to do that. It is only an in strictly intergovernmental organization. So it can only happen if the governments of all the 10 member states would agree to join forces and negotiate that together. But then even if they do that, who would get it first? Yes. Where will it go to? So it is very difficult, and I think so. This is very unlikely to happen, unfortunately. Actually, if I talk to healthcare experts around Southeast Asia, they expect it will it will come here last. It will take a long time, and it's a major. It's extremely complicated to, uh, to do this because uh, likely the the vaccine has to. You need to complete cold supply chain, uh, and that, that doesn't really exist in, uh, in many countries in Southeast Asia, especially not in the big archipelagos, Indonesia and the Philippines. Well, two final questions, Hans. Uh, Thailand is also into uh, joining the race for the vaccine. So are you optimistic about uh, what will come out of Thailand? Because if Thailand will be successful, then it's do you think it's easier for us here in Southeast Asia? I, I imagine so. I, I really don't know. Uh, <laughs> I'm not an expert in, the, in, in, in judging that. I mean, it would be, it, it is fantastic to see how many efforts there are around the world. And it's also great to see that one of them is taking place in, uh, in Thailand. Well, let's hope for the best. And, but we know it's extremely difficult in, to, uh, to develop uh, a vaccine is in such a short period of time. Uh, let's hope, because if, if indeed Thailand will be successful, then we are nearby, we are next door. Yes. <laughs> and then we, we all around Southeast Asia are much more likely to get the, uh, the vaccine. But even if we get it, then there's still the issue of a cold supply chain. It has to be most likely exactly 81 degrees minus Celsius. And that is, that, is, uh, that is difficult and very expensive to build that out, especially in the Philippines, Indonesia. Oh, I just wanted to ask you this final question because yesterday in the State of the Nation address of President Duterte, he opened, one of the first things he announced was he had a phone call. He spoke to President Xi Jinping 
about five days ago, and he said that he asked for preferential access to the vaccine. And he assured the Filipinos that it's just around the corner. So after listening to you, I doubt if, if this is uh, going to happen. Uh, because China may use the vaccine also as a tool of its diplomacy. What do you think? Yes, uh, yes. I think, uh, by the way, and, uh, and unfortunately, the, 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 US, oh, the, the U.S. too. By the way, I don't know. I don't know how President Xi knows that the virus is just around the corner, that the vaccine, rather, is just around the corner. I think that is just hubris. Uh, I think we are, I think these statements are more political than that they are based on science. Uh, I mean, I, I wish it would be true, but it's very difficult to believe. I mean, normally it takes 10 years to design and develop uh, a vaccine. Now we're trying to do it in, uh, in six months to a year, which is a miracle if, if they would succeed. So I think this is a more political statement than a statement based on facts and science, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you, Hans, for keeping our feet on the ground, you know. <laughs> Most welcome, Eris. And, welcome. and also, yeah, thank you for being uh, uh, very candid about your assessment of the situation in Southeast Asia. And we hope we will keep in touch and talk to you again on... I'm uh, very much looking forward to that. I'll try to be a regular attendee of your webinars. Thank you so you much. Are. Most welcome. Yeah. Most welcome and uh, delighted to, to have you attend and delighted to, uh, to be on the show. Yes, and thank you to our viewers and our listeners. We just spoke with Hans Vrins and we hope that we will continue this conversation watching Southeast Asia. Thank you and goodbye.